now, back to your turn on 1330 WEBY, Northwest Florida's talk radio. The phone lines are open, so call in and join the conversation at 623-1330. We are back. My name is Renee Giacchino. I'm corporate counsel for the Center for Individual Freedom, and I'm hosting this version of Your Turn, the program that I've dubbed Meeting Nonsense with Common Sense. Well, I've said this many times before in the, I'm not sure how many years, we might be coming up to 10, if not more, years that I've had the pleasure of hosting this program here on 1330 AM WEBY, that one of my favorite things is when I get to interview a book author. I get the pleasure of reading his or her works. They've poured their energy, almost like birthing a child in some instances, they've admitted, um, into their work. And I get the pleasure of reading it, um, Get actually get paid to read it, in fact, I guess you could say, and then have the pleasure of interviewing the author. And I'm certainly thrilled to be able to do that this afternoon, particularly as we lead up to our nation's best holiday, that is the 4th of July, uh, where we celebrate the anniversary of the birth of this nation. And what better book to do? Unusual for their time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. And this is volume one, written by our guest, Andrew Oak. Andrew Oak, the First Ladies Man. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate it. Yo, thanks for having me on, Renee. It's wonderful to be here. Well, what uh, I tell you, sometimes I really wish this were television because people could see um, my reaction and how I look because right now I am green with envy. <laughs> um, and I know that in your travels that took well over a year uh, that you undertook on behalf of C-SPAN that led you to the work that you did for them, that which, which then led to this book, that there were many times, and, and you discuss, you know, it's certainly in, in your opening, that it wasn't all, you know, a cakewalk, so to speak. Uh, but I am green with envy that you had the opportunity to do this. So before we start talking about the, the book in more specifics, um, let me ask, did, it sounds like this just sort of fell into your lap. It's not something you went out in search of, this project. And, and by I say project, let me back up and ask you to please explain to the listeners um, what preceded you actually writing this book, the work that you did as a producer. Yeah, certainly. I, and, and I did. I just kind of fell backwards into it. I was born and raised uh, around Washington, D.C., so I've always had history and American history and museums and stuff at my fingertips of being raised and schooled here, but it was never a passion. It wasn't, I wasn't a history major. I didn't focus my television or, or film production in that area. I dabbled in it here and there when the, when the project came up. But C-SPAN, a friend of mine there had approached me about the First Ladies Project, and so I joined the team, and the series was called First Ladies Influence and Image, and what attracted me to the project was that we were telling stories that hadn't been told. We were telling people about women that they knew in the sense of they understood what a first lady was, but it's almost like we were reintroducing you to an old friend. So the name was familiar. Everyone has an image when I say first lady, whether you're thinking it's Martha Washington, Nancy Reagan, Jacqueline Kennedy, Eleanor Roosevelt, whoever. We know one of them. But not many people, myself included, could, at the beginning of the project anyway, name all of them. And I just, it was so intense, the travel that I did, that was my part for the series. What, what I produced were the location pieces and packages that went into the 90-minute live show. So I went to every home, library, church, cemetery, school, museum, for every First Lady, Martha Washington through Michelle Obama. Wow. And it just, it, C-SPAN's good name gave me access to the nation's most valuable and rare collections uh, in existence. And you did, as I understand this, a, a lot of it just you and your camera. Well, it was, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the thing that it was either sink or swim. Huh. It was, I mean, there was, a, there was a production team back in Washington that, that put together the live shows and, and booked guests. We all, I, I booked some of the guests as well, but as far as going out on the road and doing the field work and getting that research done to bring these pieces back, that was me. I was a one-man band, we call it, in the television business. Mm -hmm. I had myself and seven cases, and if you go to firstladiesman.com, you can go to the journey page, and there's a little interactive map there that shows you, as I pinballed across the country for, as you say, over, over a year, it was a year and two months, to hit all these locations, and so basically for a, a year plus, I, I ate, slept, drank, lived, loved, cried, the, the first lady. It was, it was my entire life. 
the loves of your life and and many many of them and you know remarkably i think most people and myself included i'm 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 embarrassed to admit can't name all of our presidents but to be able to name all of the first ladies or the hostesses because you covered them rightfully so as well um i I think is really a remarkable thing um i am a, a a lover of history and and i'm proud to have raised three children um as well who love history and and all participated in National History Day. And I I just, as a footnote, thought I might mention to you that several years ago, uh, my third daughter did uh, a history fair project. You can actually watch it on YouTube um, called Pillbox Diplomacy, Fashion, Film, and Foreign Travels, where she highlighted, you know, I think lesser known uh, things about Jackie Kennedy, how mm-hmm. actually, you know, her involvement with fashion, film, and foreign travels really elevated JFK's presidency. And and I think, you know, um, talk you you know the quote that you use throughout the book, you know, talks about you know behind every great man is is a a, a better woman, so to speak. I don't know the exact quote, but I think you know this was very true in in the case of of Jackie as well. But one of the interesting things that you note very early in the book, in the book folks is titled unusual for their time on the road with america's first ladies we only have volume one in our hands but trust me we'll we'll be you'll be waiting at the edge of your seat as i am to get volume two but you write that most of the presidents quote married up Uh, absolutely what do you mean by that and did it surprise you because boy it surprises me well it it did surprise me and again you know as as you say you know embarrassingly enough we, we all live here and not many of us can name all the presidents, and, and even fewer can name all the first ladies. So when I got into this, and it, I mean, not very far into this, I'm talking about number one, Martha Washington. George Washington married up. And in the first chapter, in the, in the introduction to the piece, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to give too much away about <laughs> the book, but, but I explain it. Martha Washington. Uh, was married before George Washington. She was a very young bride, as most women were, and she married someone who was above her social status in Williamsburg. And so when she was a widow at 26, and a young strapping George General George Washington at the time comes along, a budding military uh, career in front of him, um, she then elevates him, and what she brings to the table, what she brings to the marriage, actually allows George Washington to start America. If he had married someone else, if he had married someone with lesser uh, fortitude uh, physically and mentally, if, she had, if, she, if he had married someone with less uh, financial and social standing, he would have had to take care of things at home to make sure that he could exist and, and have a living. But Martha had it all under control by the time George came along, and he was able to then go and start a revolution which started a new country. And and what a love affair. I mean, he came into the relationship. She had, you mentioned, two children already from, you know, her prior marriage where she where she became a widow. Um, and, and, and I was surprised, um, you know, you hear these stories about, you know, and, and, and this happened obviously so long ago that, that it's hard to, to verify. But many of the stories that you tell in this book do verify the fact that you know, some of these presidents, although there were some that they probably didn't care much for each other, there were many who really were in love. The, the, you're absolutely right. And they the treated stories, each other as equals almost, too, which I think uh, is very interesting for the time. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, just even talking in the first two administrations, one, I mean, you know, the series was called Influence and Image. So image is pretty easy. We've all got an image of what our first lady, whoever, as I mentioned, you know, Nancy Reagan, Martha Washington, whoever it is. Um, uh, you know, that's in your, in your mind. And then when we think of first ladies, we think of jewelry, we think of dresses, we think of uh, plates, you know, the, the White House China, things like that. But the influence part, how do you show influence on camera? Well, it was very easy to do for, with administration number two, Abigail Adams. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was counseling John Adams as to his next steps after the vice presidency. There's letters that prove it. The, the Massachusetts Historical Society has over 70,000 pages of uh, Adams Family correspondence, and we don't have to make this stuff up. We can read right along with history as it happens. Dolly Madison helps her husband, an ailing at this point, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, post-presidency, Madison, uh, Dolly Madison helps her husband transcribe the notes of the First Continental Congress. I, I mean, these women help shape 
inform and document history from the very beginning. And the love affairs, as you mentioned, are throughout. They are absolutely throughout. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, even right up to the current presidency, um, the Obamas with their date nights and their kids and protecting their kids and raising their family, but also sitting on either fence. There's no greater love story than, than, than the Reagan. I mean, the, the letters that they wrote back and forth to each other are just remarkable. They bring, they bring tears to your eyes. Going back even further to uh, the Trumans, uh, Harry and Bess Truman, Grace and Calvin Coolidge, uh, these stories do exist. And as I researched these stories and as I went to these places and as I held the letters and held the jewelry and stood in the windows where they looked out across a courtyard and saw their, their, their future husband in, in a dormer at a show there and see these things, they stepped out of the pages of the history books and off the oil paintings and became the real people that they are. Interestingly, the Abigail Adams, I mean, I think, you know, folks who, you know, are familiar with Abigail Adams and the and the significant influence that she had. In fact, perhaps, you know, the, the in my mind, you know, when I think of uh, of a first lady who had significant influence, it, it, you know, it is Abigail Adams. But I think of, you know, her remembering the ladies letters, sure. you know, that a lot of a lot of, you know, has been written a lot about. But but interestingly, I, I was unaware of, you know, the in her letters where she basically, as you said, told her husband, don't come home as vice president. If you're going to come home, you come home either as president or you don't, or you just come home. <laughs> it's like you, you really did read the book. Not that I doubted you, but I mean, you really, really took it in. I mean, that, that, that's in, in almost every uh, live speech I give because it's so remarkable. Everyone always says, Abigail Adams, remember the ladies, remember the ladies. Right. And that's even a small, significant part of a much bigger letter where she's proving other points, but she just says basically... Without the ladies behind you, you won't succeed. So in the 1700s, Abigail Adams is telling her husband, like, you know, it, it, it's fine that the, that the men are all out starting this government and the men are voting and the men are hunting and gathering and doing all the stuff that colonial men did. But if they come home and the wife isn't happy with them, it's not going to happen. And, and you're, you're exactly right about the vice presidency. When, when Washington decided not to run for another term, he wrote back to Abigail as he did in almost all matters of life, personal, professional, all kinds of, these people spent a lot of time away from each other for the simple fact that they, there were no, you know, mass transit didn't exist. So just to get across state or go into the next town took days, months, you know, weeks. So he, uh, John Adams writes to Abigail Adams and says, basically, Washington isn't running for president. What should I do? And she did say very clearly, if you're asking about the vice presidency, I'm... Abigail Adams says to her husband, I will serve under no man other than George Washington. The great respect and great friendship they had for the Washingtons comes through in that. And she said, basically, come home president or come home. And he, and he came home to president. We are talking with Andrew Oak. He's the author of a brand new book. Folks, you're going to want to pick this up. This is going to be the perfect read for the long Fourth of July weekend. It's titled Unusual for Their Time on the Road with America's First Ladies. This is only volume one. I can't wait to get my hands on volume two. Andrew, I need to take a quick commercial break to pay a couple of the bills. Can you stay with us for a couple minutes and we'll close out with three or four minutes to close this up? Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. All right, folks, we'll be right back after this short break. Please stay tuned. Now, back to your turn on 1330 WEBY, Northwest Florida's talk radio. The phone lines are open, so call in and join the conversation at 623-1330. We are talking with Andrew Oak, Andy Oak. He's the first ladies' man, and he gets that title because he's the author of the book, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies. This is volume one that's hot off the press. I think, in fact, Andrew, if I'm right, if folks go to firstladiesman.com, can they get a signed edition? Did I see that? Absolutely. We've got hardback. We've got paperback on the store page at firstladiesman.com. You can also trace my adventure. I've got videos on there. There's a link to the series that, uh, that I did with the team at C-SPAN. There's all kinds of stuff. It's a lot of fun. Now, you chronicle here in, in this first volume, I think it's the 1700s to the 1800s, but, but of course we're going to all watch, you know, you put it out from Martha to Michelle, as you said, and, and, and this, the title, Unusual for Their Time, these ladies were in fact unusual for their time, each in their own time. Um, any of them in particular you would deem to be the most unusual I tell you, you know, it's funny. You referenced uh, your daughter's work with Jacqueline Kennedy in the Pillbox Diplomacy video. Um, 
the the it the women that we know in modern times, there were women that had to come before them to do that. So before Jacqueline Kennedy took the country by storm, there was Frances Cleveland. She's the youngest first lady in history at 21 years old. She married a 49-year-old Grover Cleveland, who was the second bachelor president. Uh, she's the only first lady to get married in the White House, and she's the only first lady uh, because of her president or her husband uh, to serve two non-consecutive terms. Well, his second non-consecutive terms was won in part by Frances Cleveland because she was young, she was attractive, she had young children in the house. These are our celebrities. These are our royalty. These are our our political uh, populists. I mean, they're, they're, they're the ones we're looking to. They're on the covers of magazines. And back then they were using Francis Cleveland on uh, uh, campaign um, memorabilia and, and, and um, uh, posters and buttons and everything. And, and if she hadn't come along, then Mamie Eisenhower couldn't have been on dresses that said, I like Mamie instead of I like Mike, and, <laughs> you know, or I like, I like Ike, sorry. Um, but, but so remarkable to me was Lucy Hayes. Lucy Hayes is someone, if you named 15 presidents, you might not name Rutherford B. Hayes. And if you named 20 first ladies, you might not name Lucy Hayes. I might have just taught people that Rutherford B. Hayes' wife's name was Lucy. But she was going out when he was a, uh, a general in the Civil War and when he was governor of Ohio, and she was working with soldiers. She was actually mending uniforms in the field. She had her sewing machine with her in the winter encampments in some of the headquarters. She, when he was a uh, governor, she would go to insane asylums, mental institutions, orphanages, hospitals. She would do the legwork that no women at that time of politicians and, and upper-crust people were doing this. So Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the most popular, well-known, and longest-sitting at four terms for her husband, died in his very early in his fourth term, and the Truman's take over. But Eleanor Roosevelt was first lady for 12 years, 12-plus years, longer than any other first lady, and no other first lady unless the law changes will beat that record. But Eleanor Roosevelt could not have done what she did, which is monumental for, for women and for politics and the role of First Lady, if Lucy Hayes hadn't been doing it uh, post-Civil War. So to see the building blocks and see the foundation built by these strong, unusual women that allowed these other women to take it to the next level, that's where the unusual for their time comes in. Well, and, and it's interesting because the summary that you write about Lucy Hayes, as I read it, you could just have inserted Jackie Kennedy's name in there. So I think you're, you're dead on there. You say Lucy Hayes was a class act. That's the Absolutely. best way to put it. Her style and beauty exuded confidence and comfort. She didn't let anyone change her. I put them, I've just written two sentences for you for volume two. <laughs> well, th thank you. I'll just copy and paste. There We're you go. There. there you go. I, I, and, and, and quite frankly, I bet you could. I mean, when you talk about unusual for their time, um, what surprises me is they had a lot more in common than than they had that was not in common. And I think that'll surprise the readers when they read this book. It's written by our guest, Andrew Oak. He's the first ladies' man. The book is titled Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1. You can get a copy. Just visit firstladiesman.com. Now, as the first ladies' man, you've got a lot of women to cover from Martha to Michelle. I um, do. I've got three children you can't pick a favorite, uh, but I'm going to ask you, have you got, at least I'll, I'll let you narrow it from this volume one, 1700s to 1800s. Have you got a first lady favorite there? Well, here's what I do. I break it down by century. So my favorite first lady of the 1700s is Abigail Adams. I learned so much about her and how influential and how she was a progressive thinker for the 21st century. I mean, she was on to civil rights and race relations and, and, and women's rights that we're still struggling with today. So, I mean, she just, she just floored me. I mean, I knew she was important. I just didn't know how important. Then when we get into the 1800s, um, it's, 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 it's Lucy Hayes. I mean, you read that chapter and you can see how much affection I have for that woman and, and what she did in a quiet, graceful manner, as you say. We get into the uh, 1900s, and my favorite's Lou Hoover. It's another one that you just don't think of. And a lot of my public speeches will focus on these women that you just don't even understand the influence they had because you wouldn't even think to name them when you're naming first ladies. But Lou Hoover is the only first lady to speak an Asian language. She taught herself Mandarin Chinese when she was living in China with her husband during the Boxer Rebellion. 
as they toured the world as, as um, uh, mineral excavators. She's the first woman to graduate from Stanford, definitely, and most likely in the United States with a geology degree. She blazed new trails. There's just no doubt about it. And then we move into the more modern, and it gets, it gets a little more difficult but, but, um, uh, to, to kind of separate them because it just, you know, you, you, you know so much more about each of them, so you're not as surprised because we were here. We see them on film, and I've been alive for so many of them. But, I, I mean, you cannot help but be attracted to Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan for the love affair, for the Hollywood romance story that was so true and so pure between the two. And then the just tragedy of losing him to Alzheimer's, where I I just... There's two women that I speak about publicly that I have a tough time not getting choked up. Jane Pierce in the 17... um, I'm sorry. um, 1800s. 1800s. Jane right. Pierce in the 1800s, and, and, and she just loses everything. She loses all of her children. One dies tragically in front of her. Not enough time to get into the details, but I promise it's a tearjerker, and it chokes me up every time. I had to, I had to leave her out of a speech on Mother's Day. Wow. I couldn't do it. I had to jump to the next woman. And, and, and the Reagans, Reagan. when she loses hit Ron to, to Alzheimer's, right. I, when I spoke about Nancy Reagan dying just recently, I said, this is not a sad occasion. She's been waiting to go up that hill in Simi Valley Aww. and sit next to her husband ever since he, he left her with Alzheimer's. And Andy, we gotta, I got to cut you short. I apologize. I want to again give folks the name of the book. First, I want to thank Andrew Oak. Thank you for writing this book and the journey. Unusual for their time on the road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1. Thank you for being our guest. Can't wait.